Hey, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, so you've already seen this uh, diagram in a uh, slightly more vertical form, but uh, uh, I'm going to talk today exclusively about turning sugar, regardless of what source it comes from, into advanced biofuels. Uh, Tim mentioned ethanol. Uh, ethanol is a great start, uh, but it has a number of challenges. Uh, it doesn't have the full fuel value of gasoline. It requires an energy-intensive purification process. It's toxic to this microbe, yeast, at high concentration, so it's only produced at about 20%, and therefore you have to distill it out uh, of about 80% water, um, and it can't be transported using traditional means. We can't pipe it. We have to uh, ship it by rail or by truck. I like to say that ethanol is better for drinking than for driving. So if you wanted to think about an advanced biofuel, what are the factors that would go into that? Well, you'd want to think about the engine that you're putting it in, the content of the energy, combustion quality, whether it's an, a combustion engine or an ignition engine, uh, whether uh, the cloud point, people don't like cloudy things uh, in their cars. Uh, it's got to be volatile. It's got to be stable for storage and shipping. Uh, it can't smell. People don't like smelly things. It can't be too toxic when it gets into the environment. Uh, it can't be miscible with water because then it'll be transported through the environment and it'll also pick up water and pipelines. And it can't be $400 a gallon. So um, if you think about some of the properties that you want in fuels, uh, in almost every fuel that we want to produce, we want some branch in the chain. Uh, in uh, things like diesel fuel and jet fuel, the branches keep them from freezing. Uh, in, in things like gasoline, we want a fair number of branches. Uh, and, and the same is true for uh, jet fuels. These are, are much like kerosene, a little bit like diesel fuel. So uh, branches are good things. And uh, in biology, branches are made in part by the isoprenoid biosynthetic pathway. Now, I've shown on this uh, plot of uh, central metabolism all the potential fuels that one could generate. But I'm going to focus today exclusively on uh, isoprenoids and their synthesis. Now, just a little background on isoprenoids. They come from isopentanyl pyrophosphate, a C5. Uh, this is a, uh, isomerized to form dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. The two condense to form the C10 geranyl pyrophosphate. Uh, you get the C15 with two IPPs and a DMAP and the geranyl geranyl pyrophosphate from three IPPs and a DMAP. And then these can be cyclized or turned into any of the biological molecules we'd like to use. Now, uh, in the past, my laboratory has focused a lot on isoprenoid metabolism, uh, specifically for production of the anti-malarial drug artemisinin and derivatives thereof. And uh, we have now in our hands a microbe that will produce a hydrocarbon. And so it can be repurposed from anti-malarial drugs to things like production of advanced biofuels with uh, branches on the chains. Now, just a little bit about building a microbe to produce isoprenoids. Uh, we, in my lab, started with E. coli. We've since done similar work in yeast. Uh, all organisms produce uh, farnesyl pyrophosphate. Uh, in E. coli, this is used for quinone biosynthesis and for the synthesis of the cell wall. Uh, it's absolutely essential, but produced in small quantities. Uh, it produces farnesyl pyrophosphate using the DXP pathway, uh, shown here in not much detail. So uh, when you want to start to produce an isoprenoid, you take a gene from whatever organism you're taking it from. In most cases, uh, most of the interesting isoprenoids come from plants. Uh, and one characteristic that we got out of these early on when we started expressing them uh, in E. coli is that they produce very low yields of the final product. And this uh, was early work in my laboratory and others' uh, laboratory showed that they also got very low uh, production levels. And obviously, this is not what you want when you're producing a fuel or an anti-malarial drug. Um, so a common practice in my lab now is to resynthesize genes. We resynthesize re the amorphodine synthase gene. This is an intermediate in the synthesis of the anti-malarial drug artemisinin. And when you do that, of course, you can change out the uh, rare codons that are found in plants or rare to at least E. coli when it's expressed there. And in some cases, you can get a, a substantial improvement in the production. In this case, we got over a hundredfold improvement.
It's not always the case, but it often helps dramatically. Now, uh, it was pretty clear to us that we were limited in farnesyl pyrophosphate production in the production of this uh, terpene. So uh, rather than use the native pathway, we brought in a completely heterologous pathway, the pathway in you and me that's responsible for cholesterol biosynthesis. And because there's a great deal known about it, it we could get the genes from any source. We could also tap into acetyl-CoA. Now, this is one of the challenges when you're producing any product in E. coli, particularly if you're doing it under fermentation conditions is that E. coli shunts out the excess acetyl-CoA as acetate and pickles itself in the fermentation. So by tapping into the acetyl-CoA pool with something like the mevalonate pathway, you, could, you can limit the production of acetate, and this turns out to be uh, tremendously beneficial. Uh, so we synthesized a pathway, the mevalonate pathway, in two operons, broke it up at uh, mevalonate for an important reason, that we could feed mevalonate into the medium, it would go into the cells, we could get the bottom part of the pathway functioning, because we had a knockout in the DXP pathway, the cells wouldn't grow without a functioning MEV pathway. We then took away the MEV, added in the top part of the pathway, and got a functioning cell that improved production yet another hundredfold. So this gets us pretty close to our target of a gram per liter, but I want to talk and spend most of my time talking about how we optimize metabolic pathways because uh, it ends up being a significant challenge and there's a great need for tools. And so I'm an advocate for synthetic biology because it really aids us in pathway engineering. And I want to talk about uh, the balance of producing terpenes from farnesyl pyrophosphate. As I mentioned, it's uh, necessary for growth of the cells because it's in uh, quinone, needed for quinone biosynthesis and cell wall biosynthesis. Uh, we naively thought if we fed a lot of mevalonate to the cells, they would immediately produce a lot of, in this case, sesquiterpene. Uh, what we found out is that if you feed too much mevalonate, it actually poisons the cells. And this is illustrated by uh, doing a knockout of that sesquiterpene synthase and looking at the growth of the cells with higher and higher concentrations. And you see that they grow more and more poorly the higher the mevalonate concentration. You add back in a sesquiterpene synthase and the cells grow fine. Well, as it turns out, there's uh, you accumulate IPP and DMAP um, or FPP if you have an FPP synthase and this appears to be inhibitory in some way to the cell. We suspect it feedback inhibits the DXP pathway at some point and this prevents the cells from growing. But by adding in a carefully balanced terpene synthase, you actually get the appropriate flux through the pathway and you don't rob the cells of needed FPP for growth. Now, I want to talk a little bit about balancing the top part of the pathway because this is where we've had most of our challenges. And uh, just to remind you about the top part of the pathway, it takes acetyl-CoA and produces mevalonate, goes through three enzymes. This is an E. coli enzyme, acetoacetyl-CoA synthase. Uh, HMG-CoA synthase is a yeast enzyme, and this enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, uh, is from yeast as well. We've truncated it at the end terminus to remove the membrane binding region. And what we noticed early on is that if you overexpress this pathway, either under the control of a very strong promoter or on a high copy plasma, the cells grow very poorly. At moderate levels of expression or on low copy plasmids, the cells grow okay, but still noticeably different from uh, the ideal cell growth when there's no pathway inside the cell. We did a series of studies using transcript arrays and proteomics and some targeted me metabolite analysis and determined that we were accumulating HMG-CoA to a very high level when we introduced this pathway. We then uh, assayed for the HMG-CoA reductase and determined that the activity was falling off in time as it's being expressed. We suspect that it was falling apart inside the cells. The result was that we accumulated HMG-CoA and what we suspect is the case is that this uh, is a competitive inhibitor for malonyl-CoA, and so uh, we get an inhibition of flux through FABD. 
we see malonyl-CoA accumulating, and we see the induction of genes involved in fatty acid biosynthesis, meaning that the cells are starved for fatty acids. Now, the result here and what caused the toxicity, though, is interesting. If you express FabB, you get unsaturated fatty acids. You can't see them, they've fallen off the screen here, but unsaturated fatty acids pulled off the saturated, uh, the fatty acid biosynthetic pathway. So you get fewer saturated fatty acids, more unsaturated fatty acids, and this is toxic to the cells. So you could add back saturated fatty acids, at least that's what the literature teaches us, and we actually did this. We made a knockout in the uh, pathway. Um, the cells grew fine. Uh, with the active mevalonate pathway, the cells grow really poorly, but if you add saturated fatty acids, the cells nearly recover. Now, the problem, this is great for us because it appears that we found the solution to the problem, but the problem with this solution is that uh, fatty acids are extremely expensive. You couldn't really add them to uh, fermentation broth if you're producing a biofuel. So we had this imbalance in the metabolic pathway and we needed to solve that imbalance. And there are a couple of ways of doing this. One is to balance the expression of all the genes in the pathway. So if you underexpress HMG-CoA synthase and maybe overexpress HMG-CoA reductase, you can balance the pathway. This turns out to be uh, a, a challenge to do. It takes a great deal of work to do. We did it by balancing uh, the transcript stability of the transcripts that encode those enzymes. I don't want to talk more about that solution. Uh, you can read that. It's uh, been published a few years ago. The solution I do want to talk in some detail about is how we express enzymes and heterologous pathways inside a cell. Generally, we put the genes that encode the enzymes in the metabolic pathway on high copy plasmids, express them at relatively high levels inside the cell, and uh, we just expect the intermediates to get from one enzyme to the next. Um, and if one of those intermediates happens to be toxic and diffuses throughout the cell, then that can cause a problem. Now, we don't do our plumbing this way when we put plumbing in our houses. We connect the, the pipes together. Um, uh, we can actually screw them in together. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, really a formula for the screw threads to connect the metabolic pipes. So how might we put enzymes together to create something like a pipeline that will get the uh, metabolism flowing from acetyl-CoA to mevalonate? And it's great that I could follow Wendell Lem because the solution actually came from his laboratory. Um, the solution uh, was de developed by John Duber, who was a graduate student in Wendell Lem's laboratory and then came to Berkeley as a QB3 fellow, and I was fortunate enough to be able to work with, when, uh, with uh, John Duber. Uh, and his concept was, well, if we don't know the, the theory or the formula for the pipe threads on putting those enzymes together, maybe we could just add the enzymes to a scaffold and get them to work together. And that scaffold was the same signaling scaffold that Wendell talked to you about. If you add to now the C-terminus of each one of these enzymes a ligand that would specifically bind a binding protein, in this case three binding proteins that were put together with amino acids between them into a scaffold, maybe they would bind that scaffold very specifically. And so rather than those metabolites just diffusing throughout the cells, the, the enzymes would be co-located and the product of one enzyme would have a much better chance of binding the next enzyme in the metabolic pathway. And if one of those intermediates happens to be toxic, then we would prevent a buildup of that intermediate in the cell. So we use the uh, GBD, the SH3, and the PDZ binding domains and their specific ligands. Again, we put the ligands on the uh, uh, C-terminus of each one of the enzymes and strung together the GBD, SH3, and PDZ binding domains with linkers between them. Uh, and this is uh, just a diagram of the construct here. There's an operon that express ADOB, HMGS, and HMGR, and then a separate construct expressing the scaffold protein that's synthetic. Now, the beauty of this system is that you can vary 
the number of enzymes that you attach to the scaffold. So if you want to have more HMGRs, for instance, if it appears to be the rate limiting step, you might be able to add in uh, more specific binding regions and bind more copies of HMGR. So we did an experiment. We held the first enzyme constant because it's an E. coli enzyme, well studied, and we varied by one, two, and four, the HMGS, and by one, two, and four, the HMGR on that scaffold. And then we looked at the relative production of mevalonate um, as a function of those different constructs. And you can see here in the center where we've got uh, two copies of HMGR, the last enzyme in the pathway, two copies of HMGS, one copy of 8OB, we get about a 77-fold improvement in production. And this comes out this week in Nature Biotech. So a number of optimizations, including that one, got us well over this hurdle of a gram per liter of production of terpenes. But we were producing this intermediate for uh, artemisinin biosynthesis. And the question is, can we now repurpose this host for production of specific biofuels? Now, I want to turn to some of these biofuels. So uh, the first ones we might want to produce are gasoline replacements. Uh, and I show here isopentenol and isopentanol. Um, and these have the nice property of being C5 alcohols. Um, so they have uh, relatively high octane numbers. Uh, in fact, they have a high energy content of about 96% of gasoline. The, their octane numbers are right around 100, so that's just about the, oct that's the octane number of octane. In fact, 224 trimethylpentane. They have low solubility in, in water and they can be blended with gasoline very easily. So they look to be really great targets. Now, to make these from uh, DMAP and IPP, we need a phosphatase and then a reductase. And we don't have those enzymes. Uh, we first needed the phosphatase. Well, even though we didn't have the enzyme, we could go searching for it. We could actually use a tool that we had built. If you remember when we were optimizing the bottom part of this mevalonate pathway, I told you about the accumulation of IPP and DMAP that caused a toxicity in the mevalonate pathway. And uh, that toxicity is shown here. Uh, and you can relieve that by expressing, in this case, a sesquiterpene synthase that allowed the cells to grow. So could we do something similar? Could we come up with a specific phosphatase that would cleave uh, that pyrophosphate, not cleave ATP or ADP or anything else, but be specific for that, relieve the toxicity. Well, uh, as it turns out, Bacillus produces isoprene, and we originally went in to look for an isoprene synthase. Um, but what we found, in fact, was a phosphatase. So we made a gene library of Bacillus. We transformed it into our E. coli that had no uh, phosphatase here, so it was accumulating IPP and DMAP, which were toxic to E. coli. And then we asked the cells to grow if they had the appropriate phosphatase. So if you don't add any mevalonate to the cells, there's no activity through that pathway, there's no toxicity, all the cells grow fine. If you add mevalonate, only those cells that have a phosphatase are able to grow well. Those that don't have a phosphatase don't grow well. You go in there and you look, and we in fact found two different phosphatases and have since expressed that and gotten isopentanol biosynthesis. And now we're screening libraries to find higher and higher activities of uh, phosphatases. And there are, are a number out there in the literature and out in nature. Now we need a reductase to produce uh, three methyl butanol. And in fact, we've screened several reductases and found some, some pretty good reductases that will work together with the phosphatase to produce isopentanol. Now, the beauty of this system is that once you produce these alcohols, you can start to produce esters. And some of those esters will make great biodiesels as well. And so we're now working on how we can vary the chain on either side of the ester group. Um, and these will produce biodiesel molecules that aren't seen naturally and that may have some very ideal properties um, as diesel molecules. And actually, we've tested a number of these, and uh, this is very difficult to see, but this is a table of cetane numbers. So cetane is the analog to octane. So cetane is to diesel as, as octane number is to gasoline. And there are two molecules here that have pretty much ideal cetane numbers. And we're now going in and engineering the biosynthetic pathway to produce these molecules. 
Now, in uh, the last few minutes, I want to leave you with uh, uh, how we might produce other molecules, particularly molecules that might be used as either diesel fuels or even better, as jet fuels. And the, the problem is that we'd like to produce a number of different molecules. Um, these are all C15s. Uh, you can tell that they're all reduced. Um, and there are a variety of terpene synthases out there in the literature. But the problem with the terpene synthases that are available is that they have variable production in the host. So uh, I just want to highlight a couple of these. Uh, bisabolene synthase produces 150 micrograms per liter in uh, Saccharomyces and three orders of magnitude higher in E. coli, and yet there are other synthases out there that produce much higher in Saccharomyces and much lower in E. coli. So because of the variability in the terpene synthases, we actually took a terpene synthase that we knew we could express really well, in this case, gamma humulene synthase, and then tailored it to produce one specific molecule. Now, this uh, terpene synthase produces 50 different terpenes. So we actually went into the active site of that uh, terpene synthase, that gamma humulene synthase, identified the residues, we call them plasticity residues, that are important for tailoring that enzyme to focus on a specific molecule. And with three mutations to those plasticity residues, we could focus the production. In this case, so if you look at seven here, this is the starting uh, chromatogram. We took that enzyme that barely produced any of seven and made it into an enzyme that produced almost exclusively seven. And we've now done this with several different uh, we use this, the same terpene synthase, but focused in on several different terpenes. And in some of the cases, this works really well, like in this case, um, and in this case, and in other cases, we still get families of products coming out, but a very small number of mutations to take a terpene synthase that functions very well and get it to produce these terpenes in E. coli. So um, that summarizes the work on producing uh, branch chain alkanes and alkenes in, and alcohols in E. coli. Uh, these are some of the people in my laboratory and at JBay that did the work. The initial part of the work was supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the latter part of the work by the U.S. Department of Energy. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and you for your attention. <laughs>